Uh, let us pray. Uh, we need to pray for the President of the United States and his wife and those in the Senate who are sick. And um, this is a season to understand what the Scripture says in Second Timothy about praying for authority. Um, this is not a season when someone is sick, we drop all political agendas, we drop everything, and we pray for his safety and healing as a leader of our nation. So as I pray, I ask you at home to do the same thing that we keep in our prayers. I'm not going to say our thoughts, as they always say on news. Uh, he's on our thoughts, but it's our prayers that matter. Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Christ Jesus. And so I lift up the President and the First Lady and those senators who are sick and those who are sick around them. We ask, Lord, healing over him, wisdom for the doctors and the medicine they're giving him that he will rise up from this sickness. We ask, Lord, that in this nation, at this moment, that we might understand what unity is all about and what can happen when we walk in unity for the goodness of not only those we agree with, but those we may not agree with. And may the peace of God rest upon him and those around him, and we ask that you would raise him up. We ask wisdom around our county that you continue to put your hand here and keep back the virus. You pour out your spirit over us now, Lord, as we go forward. And I ask, Lord, as we go into the word of God, that we might understand how to win this spiritual battle. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in the sermon today. It's called The Spiritual War. We'll start in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Starting verse 1, we'll go through verse 6. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, I'm bold towards you. But I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with the confidence by which I tend to be bold against some who think as of us as if we walk in the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God and pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. Every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience with your disobedience is fulfilled. Let's give some context to why Paul is saying what he's saying in the beginning here. There is division over him in the church of Corinth. If you go back to 1 Corinthians, he's rebuking them for allowing sin in the church and not rebuking it, not removing it. He's calling them out, saying that we are different, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But there's a contention for those who did not want to accept his apostleship, his authority over the church. So when he says, I Paul myself and plead with you, he's speaking to those who seem to have division in their heart who want not to submit to his authority as a founder of the church and the apostleship that he speaks of, he received from Christ at his salvation. So he says, with you by meekness and gentleness of Christ, who are present lowly among you. This meekness is a word that cannot necessarily, it could have only put gentleness here. It's a disposition of even-tempered, tranquil, balanced in spirit, and he had his passions under control. And when he speaks the word gentleness, that means graciousness, fairness, reasonable. And when he talks lowly, he's humble. So what he's telling them, I can come boldly to you, but not in my flesh, not in what I want to tell you and how the world would want to correct people. I don't want to do it in severity. I want to do it in the spirit of Christ. I want to do it in a way that you would understand it's not my attitude towards you, even though maybe he may have had some issues with those who were causing division and hurt in the church who were coming against his authority that God had given him. He was not going to go into it fleshly. He says, I'm doing this in the meekness and gentleness of who? Christ. And then when he gets to number two, he says, I beg you that when I'm present, I am not be bold with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some. I don't want to have to come to you in harshness. 
I want you to hear my heart and who I am, what I've done. I don't want to. And you're saying, what does this have to do with spiritual war? He's not warring with individuals, as we'll get later on in the scripture. He's warring in the spirit realm. And so if you're going to war in the spirit realm, you don't do it in a natural way by flesh. So he's saying, I don't want to be severe with you. And as we walk this out, I want to walk according to the spirit. But some of you say I'm doing this in the flesh. It's interesting that when we as pastors or leaders in the church must go to people with correction, we must not do it out of the worldly attitude how the world wants to correct. It's like working for a boss who is not saved and he desires to come and correct some part of work for you and he does it with anger, fear, coming at you with everything he can to take away your job, to get you in a place where you will submit. That's how the world works. That's not how Jesus works. So Paul is setting us up to understand in the spiritual battle how we might walk, how we might be in this realm of war, because there is a war. So when he gets to verse 3, he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. But he's saying very clearly, I live on this earth. I live here. There's flesh all around us. There's a worldly way of thinking all around us. Though I walk here, I don't war the way the world wars. We live in a season of upheaval in emotions from, so, from social injustice in the streets to a pandemic and a division over it. There's all this going on. We don't war the way the world is warring right now. It's sad that when someone gets sick, people put it down on Facebook. Or is it really real? And I've watched this thing shift over the last weekend because now we have someone who is sick that we're all to pray for, according to Scripture. But yet some are angry because they didn't like him the way he handled things, so they want to war against him in the flesh. But we as a church should war against the darkness that may come against all of us, not just what we agree with. So Paul is saying, I live here. We all live here in the world. We all walk in our flesh, in our normal way of thinking, but we don't go after the enemy that way. So many people want to walk in this authority of war, and we know that the devil does things against people. We know that he brings conflict. We know what he does through people is evil. We see the abuse of people. We see the heaviness of people, that what they go through, and the, and the sin that people do to people, the anger, the rage. And so sometimes, if we think we're going to war against the darkness, in the attitude of darkness, it ain't going to work. That's what the world does. The world releases hate, judgment, anger, division. But when we war, we don't war like them. We don't walk like them. We're not to do those things. So the people, according to the flesh, he says, are the thought that we're not governed by the high and holy principles, but by the worldly policy or thinking, personal interest, ambition, a love of dominion over people, wealth, popularity. He's not saying corrections in the spirit, but how we do it in the selfishness of our own heart. Let a loved one, and this is what I teach people, someone that we may love gets offended by someone, gets hurt through gossip, slander, whatever it might be. And then we may be connected to them like a spouse or a brother or a friend. And we see what they're going through. And they seem to be going through it better than we do. But the one who wants to protect the one who's been hurt, the friend, the husband, or the wife, or however, they become more angry. They, they grab that second offense level. And what happens is then they want to respond 
as the world would respond. We can't win that battle. How did Jesus make it through this time on earth when he walked here? As he was training disciples, as he was releasing the word, releasing the kingdom, he was by himself in many cases. How did he get through this mess? He had the whole world against him. He had the enemy come, as it says in John, and tempted him in the desert. How did he win the fight? How did he make journey from his birth into his crucifixion? How did he walk on this earth with all this coming against him? Because he walked in the spirit that the Father had put over him and the obedience to do so. We're not going to win the battle of darkness over our communities, over our families, by taking the war on as the world would. Oh, I'm going to bring justice to that. That person deserves this. I don't like that person for what they did. And we allow our anger and our flesh to rise up. And then we wonder why the victory doesn't come. We wonder why the angels may not be warring with us. Because we're warring with darkness. With darkness. You know what it says in the scripture that a house divided cannot stand. And so when Jesus was casting out a demon in Matthew 18... And the Pharisees came against him, and this is what they said to him. You know, you're, you're doing this as Beelzebub, the devil. And he said, well, house divided. So if we want Christ to defeat the darkness around us, if we want to have the authority that should be and is in us as sons and daughters of God, if we want to win this spiritual battle for lost souls, if we want to see a pandemic put down, if we want to see financial justice come, if we want to see the things that we're really crying out for, we can't do it as the world does it. Jesus walked in the Spirit. He would be accused. Many times he'd just walk away when they're ready to stone him. And he would say, well, even when he confronted James and John, where they look over and there's some people who are speaking against them, doing things contrary, what did James and John say to Jesus? Can we call fire down from heaven? Those are our enemies over there. Let's take them out. And Jesus didn't agree with that. He rebuked them. What did he say? What spirit are you of? What was he saying? You're walking in the spirit of darkness. To solve the problem with, against darkness, and it will not happen. And he, and he told him, why do you think I came? I came to save. I didn't come to destroy. The church wants to win a spiritual battle in this season for revival. We must begin to walk like Christ walked and make war in the heavens as he makes war. He tells us to bless our enemies. He tells us to pray for those who spitely use us. He tells us to make war in a way that we're not used to making war. So Paul says, it's not according to flesh. In verse 3, in verse 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty in God and pulling down strongholds. So this stronghold is what's over people's minds. When I got saved, the I'm praising God for the deliverance I got within a month of my salvation from drugs and alcohol. I was overjoyed. No more temptation. No more thoughts. He delivered that pharmacia off of me. But then, maybe he didn't quite deliver my temper. No, he didn't deliver my temper. And I don't know why, but what was it about? That stronghold in my mind and how I was raised and the athletics I played is to win, is to be aggressive, to be violent in your attack when you play football as a linebacker, is to hit the other guy and try to hurt him, to grow up in a culture where if somebody did something wrong, you didn't turn the cheek. You turn their cheek. That's what I grew up in. That was the culture. What was it? 
the fleshly way the world functions. So as I grow in Christ, when I see injustice, which is the hardest thing for me to deal with, is the injustice brings anger to me. When I see people who've been abused and hurt, been taken advantage of, manipulated, controlled, I'm known to have hard conversations after I leave the office. To see the effect of evil over people. To see the effect of what it does to a person's identity and their spirit person. To see what it does to their heart and their identity. And to hear their pain. And my weakness is want to bring revenge in their behalf. To see the physical Emotional, sexual abuse I've seen over all 20 years of counseling. I have to watch it because I can go home on the way wanting to say, Lord, you know who did it. Get him. And stay and saying, Lord, you know who did it. Save him. That's hard. I struggle. And I do pretty good, better than I did years ago. Because why? I had to change something up here. I can't think as the world thinks. I have to think like Jesus thinks. I have to begin to deal with the, the flesh that wars against me, and I can't war back against it in the flesh. So we're to walk. When we walk in the flesh, we live on earthly desires and wants. We want revenge over those who hurt us. We want to take things into our own hands. Because we can say to ourselves, you know, Jesus, I, did you turn your back and see this happen? Why didn't you take care of this? Where were you when this happened? How come you didn't stop it? All these things that the enemy desires to build a fortress in my mind. That Christ can't do it. That Christ won't do it. That's why he says, our weapons are not of flesh, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What's he saying to us? God can do it. This turns to a place of faith in our hearts. It turns to a faith that Christ is greater than all the evil we see in the world. As we we see uh, the abundance of sexual abuse to children, to all the things that are going on in the world and the anger of, of those who, are, who want to oppose it. That. that pedophile needs to hang and these people need to burn in hell and all those things will take place if they don't repent. Our toughest point I'm trying to get through today is I want to win a war over my city. I want to win a war over my region. I want a place full of light. Because when the light does come, the darkness will be seen for what it's doing. People will be exposed and God will say, I can take that person now and remove them from your presence because I will convict them. I will show the world what they're doing. But if we war against those who rule over us in evil, with evil, we will not see the rulers pulled down. We will not see a land changed. We will not see a revival we're crying for if we want to do it the fleshly way rather than the spiritual way. So he says, pull down these things. Warfare we're engaged in is with sin, idolatry, and all forms of evil. We don't engage in this war fleshly, in worldly thinking. Paul, as as a soldier, was a great captain of his salvation to fight his battle and to make conquest for Christ. Do you understand that we're called into a spiritual army? And that army cannot function under rebellion of its commander. When you see men and women go to war, they follow orders. The first thing they train them, when they send them to the boot camp, is that to quit thinking for themselves. And listen to the commander over them. 
when it goes from private to sergeant to lieutenant all the way up, there's a reason that is done. So you will not have an army of chaos, an army of vengeance on their own. That's why there's such thing as war crimes. There's such thing, there's a war that can be fought without breaking the rules. We have an army led by a captain named Jesus, King of Kings. We're to fight this war with him under his authority. We're not to walk ourselves into our own desires of the worldly way, but to win the battle as Jesus won the battle when he was here. He didn't come and just walk and teach us. He came and showed us. He came and walked it. He came and stood against all hell. He stood in the garden weeping in tears that dropped the blood that he would obey and do what God told him to do. See, obedience in the army is the utmost victory. I've been in this spiritual war in this city for 30 plus years. The battle seems to go on and sometimes I say to myself, when are you going to break the yoke? When is this darkness going to be lifted? When are we going to see the victory? So as I was preparing this message, my heart was very stirred about the victory I want to see. I want to see the people I see on Facebook living in sin, in idolatry of other gods, living in darkness. That I've watched this war go on for so long is we have many people in this congregation will be inviting people to come. They'll be going through demonic oppression. They'll be under spiritual attack. And they'll go through all these things and they'll start talking to their friends and say, oh, I need to come and get free. I need to put my life in Christ's hand. I need to do all these things. And then they'll say, I'm coming to church on Sunday. I just can't wait. I want freedom. And you know what happens? Immediately. If their weakness is they need a boyfriend, a boyfriend comes. Every time. They got the comfort of their heart, worldly comfort. They don't come. Or they've been clean for three, four weeks and they're ready to make the move. And then the friend comes in town and just happens to take, bring drugs to them. Or just happen to bring a six pack to them. And off they go. See, there's a war going on, and we can't win this war by fighting the way the enemy fights. It's not about people. It's about the sin and the idolatry and all forms of evil. See, Paul was a soldier. So this is what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of life that he may please him who's enlisted him as a soldier. We must engage ourselves in the spirit. We can't entangle ourselves in the worldly affairs and expect the world to change if we're like them. We must begin to walk with a different attitude, a different spirit. The best of the spirit comes to us by our salvation and comes within us. And then when we encounter the power encounter of God, however it might come, whether it's in the baptism of the spirit with tongues or gifts or however, there is a power that must come. And it doesn't come through the thinking of your mind. It comes by the power of the spirit. For the spirit now wars for us. But if we war in the flesh, the spirit cannot war for us. Our warfare is the corrupt desires and sensual presentations of the heart. What we really want to do in the flesh. What we really want to surrender to and fight the battle. Our battle, our war is with darkness and spirits of evil that seek to destroy. Hollywood has made the battle in the spirit very interesting to me. Those who do not believe, those who are directed by evil forces, they make movies, they make things to either bring great fear over us about demons and see the victory of demons and see the change of evil, that the answer to a problem is revenge. 
You killed my brother, now I kill you. The movies have all set up an attitude of how the world thinks, and if we fall into that, we cannot win this battle. So in Ephesians chapter 10, I mean chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities, against powers, against rulers of this dark age, <coughs> against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm laughing for one reason. As I get to read that scripture, if you could feel what's going on in my throat. So I'm going to read it again. <coughs> tickle, tickle, tickle. We do not war against flesh and blood, but principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There, that's better. The tickle's going away. Let me give you a testimony. My wife and I got a blessing someone gave us this week, and we were up in Reading in a meat store. I had never been in that meat store. Oh, my God. Um, my flesh was definitely excited because there's nothing more that I want to eat. More meat, more meat, more meat. So I'm in the meat store. We would ordered some meat. And all of a sudden, I'm in spiritual warfare. I mean some of the hardest pain I've ever felt in my heart. Now, my first response would be, am I having a heart attack looking at all that sausage? <laughs> the flesh was going, mm, I don't know. It could be. Or is it the tri-tip? Is it the T-bone? What is it? I knew right away it was spiritual. I don't know what was going on in that store. I know it wasn't the store. But the store is full of people. And our spirit man is picking up on something. And I'm having war. And I have a mask on so they couldn't hear me going, in the name of Jesus, get off of me. They probably thought the guy was really going crazy for the meat but I was actually going off what was on my chest. And it hurt. It was warring against me. So I knew the help was pleasant and kind. I knew it wasn't them. I saw them wearing crosses. You know, they, weren't, they didn't have Nazis tacked on their forehead. There was nothing visible to be seen. But my spirit man recognized something in the spirit that my mind did not. Now, some people would have had me on a stretcher in the back of an ambulance rushing me to the hospital because he's 67. He's at that age. I knew it wasn't nothing but war. Part of it, the enemy was probably angry because I was getting blessed. He hates us when we get blessed. He really does bother, gets all bothered when you're getting blessed. Because his kingdom is not a blessing. So I started rebuking, rebuking. So when I'm reading this, I'm going, oh, hmm, a principality, a power, a ruler of this age, spiritual witness, was coming against me. I had to discern it. So it was war, so we were going to another store and gave the keys to my wife and said, you drive. Kept rebuking, within about 10 minutes it was gone, never came back. War. Something there around someone I was around, their darkness didn't like my light. Period. I wasn't concerned about it. We're coming home. We're leaving Costco. I'm driving. She goes, you okay? I'm fine. It's gone. Something wanted to take me out. I didn't walk in the flesh. I asked God, war, war. What did he say? Witchcraft. There's someone here with witchcraft. 
See, you ready for this? Have you ever walked around and run into somebody you don't know and see the light coming out of them and you know they're a believer and you run into them and you start talking to them and pretty soon, oh, you're a Christian too? And we just have that connection because light and light. Are you ready for this? If this is true, which is the word God is, that the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes, that word wild means schemes, There was a scheme starting to work against a blessing and wanted me to be taken out. As I had already began to think and prepare my mind for today. We have got to walk in the spirit, church. So this scheme, and somebody had darkness on them, and they probably didn't even know. They probably had a big critter that follows them wherever they go. Because they're not saved. They don't know why they got what they got, why they feel what they feel. But it knew me, and my spirit knew it. I'm trying to teach you about war. Now, are we supposed to be wise? Yes, about our health. I've been fighting this fight long enough. I know when certain pain comes, I'm running into someone with witchcraft or sorcery. That's how God's trained my spirit. I don't know how he wants to train your spirit, but I have an idea. It's good that you get into the spirit and find out. Some people get dizzy. Some people have headaches. Some people have anxiety. And all of a sudden, you think it's you. And the enemy's going, it's you. It's you. You don't think the devil wouldn't wish my head? This is it. You're you're taking the big one. (laughs) This is it. You're not going to get to eat that meat. You don't think that wasn't chatter in one ear? But the Holy Spirit said, no, pray, make war. So was I to get angry at whatever was in that room in my flesh? All right, which one of these devil people are in here? It wasn't about whoever was in there. It's whatever darkness was there. So what does my wife say when we get in the car? Well, I felt it too. Now, she didn't get the pain. She got something else. I'm trying to teach you. What goes on up here affects down here, and we walk down here more than we walk up here. We're so quick to leave the spot where we're seated. You hear what I'm saying? We're seated somewhere. Church, quit sitting on the ground when you're in a heavenly place. It says in that word that every spiritual blessing is yours, and you're seated where? With Christ in heavenly places. So I can sit with Jesus, look down upon the battle from the third heaven, and look at the second heaven, what it's trying to do to me. We live so much in the flesh that we cannot see what goes on in the spirit realm. I'm excited about this war. I'm excited that the congregation I'm pastoring After 30, 20 years, whatever you've been here, it's time you learn what I've taught you. There's a war. The enemy's afraid of a church that will walk in the spirit of God and take on the enemy by the spirit rather than the flesh. See, our weapons of our warfare in verse 4. It is a victory we will achieve through God, not through ourselves. I know a thought just ran through my mind that somebody in the house may have had. If you did, don't raise your hand. Are you ready? But pastor, that's you and that's your gifting. And pastor, you... This is who you are, and this is what God called you to be. Whoever had that thought, that tells me that somebody doesn't want you to know what you're being taught. (laughs) I try not to laugh at my congregation as they enjoy the prophetic words that I can give or the insight. But they sometimes don't realize I hear more than just prophetic words of encouragement, but rather prophetic words of what people are thinking contrary to the word. Not, I'm not judging you, 
Somebody wants you convinced that you can't do what I do. No, you won't do it like I do. You'll do it the way God made you to do it. But you must do it in the spirit. So I prayed in tongues on Friday. I was tired afterwards. Whatever I ran into did not want me to be blessed. Whatever I ran into, it did not win. It did not win. It had no power over me. I, fe- I f- figured out the scheme. And all I got to say, God, is this, your, is this me having a heart attack? No. The devil go in Jesus' name, get off my chest. See, there's a way to fight this fight. And Paul writes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. By purity, we fight. By knowledge of God, we fight. By long-suffering, we fight. By kindness, we fight. By the Holy Spirit, we fight. By the sincerity of love, we fight. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Are you hearing it? That's how we fight this spiritual battle. It's amazing the amount of people and, and the battle that's going on in the spirit in our city and around our region, the number of people who have jumped in front of a car who were naked, who they were looking for help and got killed, and people arrested running down the street naked. And what were they doing? They, they were uncovered so much that they didn't care about anything. But God says, first word is, Paul says, by purity. You want to win a battle against darkness? Purify thyself before the Lord. Get rid of the stuff that opens the door to that darkness. By knowledge? Knowledge of what? Knowledge of who Jesus is, what he says, what he does, and how we're to be. To tear down those things in our mind that were put there before we were saved and to renew it. And then how? Long suffering with the battle. Hanging in there for those who need it. Not giving up because it hasn't happened in two minutes. Or two months. Or two years. Or 20 years. Or 30 years. Or 40 years. If it worked out for Moses, it can work out for us. If we can stand in what we're called to be. You ready for this? The enemy has one goal. is to wear you down to get you to quit. And not believe what God has promised you. He wants to wear you down. Oh, has it happened yet? Is it going to happen? Is he going to answer his promise? Well, you go back to the knowledge. What God says, he does. What God promises, he fulfills. God is not a God who's slack. He's a God who wants to release everything upon us. We must war back against the lies of the enemy that says we will not have a victory when we already have a victory. We must begin to walk as a victorious church in the knowledge of who Christ is, not who we are, and win the battle. The Holy Spirit is here right now wanting to fill you up and get rid of those things off of your mind you've been battling with. I can feel it in the room. Yes, it's been heavy. Yes, we have not had freedom to have church like we're used to. Yes, it's not fun to go out with masks. Yes, there is sickness all around. Yes, but all those things do not change the victory of Christ. All those things do not stop the working of Christ. The Holy Spirit is not hindered from heaven because there's something going on earth. What goes on in heaven is to change what's going on on earth. It's time we pick up the mantle of God and walk in that mantle and walk in the fire of the Holy Spirit and stand right with God and stand in our purity and say, devil, you have no place in me. You can't have my way, my mind. You can't have the way I think. I'm going to think like Jesus. He does not want us to think like Jesus. You know why? The devil saw the loss he took on the cross. 
the devil saw it was all over for him. And he's been lying ever since. It started with the lie that he was not risen. And it's gone on from there till now. He can't take your salvation. He can't take nothing God has given you. If you don't believe me, go to the teaching on Tuesday night in Romans. If God be for you, who be against you? When are we going to pick up the mantle that God has given us? I'm kind of fired up this evening. I'll go back to a verse here. Casting down arguments and every high thing it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That darkness that attacked me on Friday was trying to pull me away and for me to believe things of the flesh rather of the spirit. When I asked God immediately when that first pain came, and I'm not talking a little pain. I'm talking felt like something was shoving through my chest. I said, no. Is it, Lord? Am I in trouble? No. The devil is because he's angry about something that's in you and around you. Can I just tell you the fun of being a Christian? Can I tell you it's time we start having fun as Christians? Is to walk around and watch the glory on yourself and see people freak out. Because they're not freaking out, it's the darkness over them. When you begin to get this message of the walk and the purity and the knowledge and the good things of God, when you begin to understand the complete work of Christ, when you begin to understand that the name of Jesus means something in the heavens, as I watch, Yeshua, you are Lord. Jehovah, I praise you. Forgive us, Yeshua. When you begin to know the victory is in him, he's given me patience with the body of Christ. I hear your murmurs. I'm not against you asking for help. But sometimes when I hear the devil's been talking to me all week and he's been tearing me down and he's been doing this and he's been doing that. Well, you're listening to a lowly dog compared to Jesus. I just want to say hang up the damn phone. Hang it up. Tell him I'm not going to listen to that stuff. Repeat back to him who you are. You're a son of the most high God. You're a daughter of a king who has now won the battle for you, and he gave you the Holy Spirit within you to stand as Jesus stood against Satan himself. It's time that we buckle down and buckle up the glory of God around us and not let go of it. So that argument in your head, that high thing exalts itself. What's it exalts itself? Well, you know, maybe Christ isn't strong enough. Maybe, oh, I know, oh, God, Jesus, are you really for me today? You know, I didn't read the scripture totally all the way through, and I didn't pray enough. I didn't worship. I didn't do enough. It ain't enough of what you do. It's what Christ's uh, sufficiency did. Are you to read more? Yes. Are you to pray more? Yes. Are you to worship more? Yes. But what you do does not make you holier than thou. It's the blood of Jesus that came over you at salvation that enables you to go into that kingdom fight. It's time we begin to make war. You can get delivered of your deficiencies. You can begin to act differently if you choose to. Isn't it time the nation sees a church that walks in the spirit of God and not in the flesh? Is it time for the nation to see a church that has power over darkness and it's all its evil schemes by what we stand in rather than what we run from? May the power of the Spirit of God come over you today. So these arguments that come over us. Well, remember, this is what you were. Remember what you were? Now, I like that. You ready? The devil wants you to believe what you were. Which you aren't. 
Yeah, I was a heathen. I thank God for Romans 7 at the end before 8. Oh, wretched man that I am. But praise God for Jesus Christ. So I can tell the devil, I knew you knew me then. You bound me then. You hold my soul then. But now, praise God, there is now therefore no condemnation who's in Christ Jesus. Walk in the what? Spirit and not the flesh. Take over those thoughts that come against you. I hear it right now. Confusion, get out of this room in Jesus' name. It wants you to live in confusion. Wondering about God. Is he able? Well, the word of God said he's more than able. Ready for this? More than able than you and I can think. Or even know. I can't handle that scripture. I can't wait to get home to Jesus. I can wait, wife. But I can't wait to ask him. How did that not grow in my heart? He's more than able than I think or ask. I think big things. And that's not big enough for God. I think and dream of a time that this house will be filled with the Spirit of God and the glory so thick we can't see each other because we're in the cloud of heaven. That the throne room of God will come and the cherubim will stand here and the cherubim will stand there as the throne comes down from heaven. That's what I believe. And if that's not more than that, oh, my God, what does that mean? What does that mean that will come to our city if you can think that? That he's going to do more than that. That's where I live. So, yeah, am I downcast it hasn't happened? No. It tells me I have to believe what God said will happen. I have to stand and fight. And I'm looking for an army of people who will be good soldiers of faith. Not on what you feel. Forgive me if I'm, I'm not putting you down, but I got to say it. But pastor, I don't feel it. Oh, you don't feel it. Okay. I'm sorry you don't feel it. But Jesus never asked you to feel it. Jesus asked you to believe it. The devil wants you to live by feelings. The feeling at 5 o'clock this morning when the alarm went off was I could sleep till 5.30. That was a feeling. But I've been getting up at 5 or 4 every Sunday for 15 years to spend time with him. So the feeling was... Oh, you deserve another half hour. But my life is in Christ. My strength is in Christ. The power of him comes when I meet with him. Praise God that he allows coffee to be made ahead of time. So when I got up at five, it was waiting for me. I'm just telling you, feelings are real, but that doesn't make them reality. The reality is heaven on earth. That's reality. That's what he says. Pray this, church, that my will in heaven will be a reality on earth. And who's to bring that reality? Us. By what we believe. Not what we feel. I know. I have to fight feelings, too. But they're not real. So this spiritual battle is in our minds. And the enemy is very good at building up the old things that stand against him. That's why it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, to renew your mind with the word of God. Find out what Jesus says. And you know what happens? happens to me, I'm sure it happens to you. You'll read something that'll be so powerful and you're going, wow, can that be for me? Really, Jesus? That is so big. 
Is that for me? Oh, that's got to be for those anointed pastors who have TV ministries and have big churches and have all these things that look like they're successful in the kingdom. Why would you tell that to me? I pastor a little church in a little city. What am I to do? Why you? That's what the enemy does. But then what popped in my mind by the Spirit, but I, the Lord, do not despise small beginnings. In Jeremiah, he asked, will there be one who will stand on the wall for a city? Can I find one? He didn't say he could find a thousand for Jerusalem. Can I have one? Give me one. What happened to Elijah? Why did he run away? The victory was so big, he had a hard time gripping it. He didn't, whoa. Then the enemy came. One man, 400 prophets, lost their heads that day. False prophets. But yet he ran away because of a woman, fearful of the darkness that was speaking. Well, that was fine, but you know. She hasn't died yet. That makes no sense. But God still loved him, took him up in glory at the right moment in time. And one came behind him with a double portion because he believed what God said. There's many in this house today and many who will be listening that God has great plans for you in this war. And he wants these thoughts to be taken captive. He wants you to know the knowledge of who God is, not who you are, but who you are in him. He wants you to grow into this fight that will become a joy. When I was unsaved and a heathen, because I was a heathen, unchurched, never went to church until he intersected me in my bedroom that night. He didn't ask me what I wanted to be or what to do. I remember that night when the devil showed up in my bedroom. I remember that my body was bouncing full of evil, turning ice cold as if no life in me. And I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea about spiritual warfare. I had no idea about light and darkness. And it was one of those nights that I was straight, not high, I heard this still, quiet voice say, do you believe in me? And when his word would come, my body would quit convulsing in bed, and it'd be calm and get, start to get warm. And then I said no, and he'd get cold and bounce in bed. Then he said this, do you believe in me? I got to wait for the replay in heaven. I don't know now how many times I said no. But he kept asking, do you believe in me? And the moment I said this, yes, Lord, stop. I wasn't cold anymore. I wasn't convulsing in bed anymore. I wasn't bouncing like a rubber ball in bed. I just said, yes, Lord. He came back that night. I remember looking up, and it was like watching a National Geographic time-lapse video in my ceiling. Swirling darkness, and I turned my head, and there was a demon standing there in the corner by the mirror, and I heard the same voice say, don't look at him, pick up my word. I didn't know. I, really, I was not trained in church. I didn't know about spiritual warfare. I didn't know about demons. They knew me. Because I lived with them. And they lived with me. Turned on the light, read the word out loud, and went back to sleep. I didn't pray some awesome prayer. I didn't bind the devil. I didn't quote scripture. I didn't do anything other than believe in the one who had the victory. And I didn't even know he had a victory. I didn't even know that he had won the battle for me. 
All I know was, do you believe in me? So soft, so gentle. Yes, Lord. I asked the Lord a while back, why did I say yes, Lord? And that's another sermon. But there's some things that probably happened to me in the beginning of my life, in the call of my life, in the beginning in the womb, that I had a call. He tried to kill me in the womb, the devil did, by a, a year old. I should have died. But I think my spirit man knew that voice. My mind didn't. My spirit man did. I'm telling you out here today, and I'm telling you at home, your spirit man will know that voice. And if you're a believer, you'll know. He's not going to yell like preachers do. He's not going to call you in dumb condemnation. He's going to go, do you believe? Yes, I do. Uh Uh-oh. Finished. The cross won. The blood came. Within a month and a half, I was delivered all drugs and alcohol. And the night I was delivered all drugs and alcohol, he said, I'm calling you to be a preacher. And you know what I told him? No. I'm not going to preach. I don't talk in front of people. Can I give you a clue? Your no may be no for a while, but it will be yes the longer you walk with Jesus. Even had a brother tell me that the other day. No, I I kept telling him no, kept telling him no. I'll do this. And he tried to compromise with the Lord. But I'll only do this. No, no, okay, I'll go a little farther. I'll only do this. And the whole time, the Lord, God realized, he loves us and he laughs at us. I really believe that. Because he knows he's not going to stop until he completes what he started out. Because he said he knew you before the foundation of the world. He wrote down in the book who you would be. He had all these plans for you. And he's sitting there, not enough to be mean. Father, John said no. (laughs) He doesn't really know how big I am. He's going to say no for a while. But you know what? We're going to keep. And I had person after person get in my face. I don't know what this means, John, but I see fire coming out of your throat. I could say, well, is that a sore throat? Nope. And you know what I'd do? I would not tell anybody what God said. I wouldn't let them know. Then I just think you have a call on your life. Well, Scripture says we're all called. I did everything I could. So I'm telling you right now, the spiritual war over you today is you won't answer your call. Because if you answer your call in the spirit, you're going to war in the purity, knowledge, and power, and goodness of God, and tear down strongholds in our city. <coughs> you're going to release life wherever you go. You're going to set people free as you've been set free. And you're not going to do it by having to jump up and down and bind that devil. No, you're going to walk right next to Jesus in his holiness, in his purity, and the devil will run from the power of God that will emit out of you. We had to cut worship short today. Maybe so I could go off for an hour and a half on a sermon. I'm closing my iPad. I'm turning my notes over. Could you stand, please, in the house, if you can I thought I heard Jesus say, I do have a good sense of humor. I swear I did. He just said that. I do. I really do. Because <laughs> there's joy in heaven. That's what it says. Righteousness, peace, and joy. He's full of joy. He's laughing right now. He's laughing right now that every plan of the enemy came against you. He's laughing right now and saying, if you really trust me, you're going to have more joy than you ever thought you had. No matter how big the battle, no matter what's coming against you, this joy will overcome you because it's my joy. Because I know what I start, I finish. Philippians 1, 6. He said it, he wrote it, he spoke it, and it shall be. And I'm laughing inside because when I was ready to preach, I had no fire in me. 
I'm serious. There was war. My leg's on fire. Nothing was going right. iPhones weren't working. And I laughed. Then it was time to look at the word of God and fire came because he is fire. He's an all-consuming fire. And Jesus Christ, I ask for everybody in this house right now that they'll raise their holy hands that have been washed by the blood of Jesus and by the glory of who he is. And may there be a holy fire that begins to come down upon them and they be everything they are meant to be because what God has started, he will finish in you and you will bring glory to his kingdom because you will be good soldiers in the spirit of God and no longer in the flesh. May the power of God come upon you here and those at home and may we go forward as good soldiers because we have a commander that will never let us down. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. And everyone said, Amen. amen. If you want prayer, come forward.